All right, good morning. How's everybody feeling? Are you spectacular, fabulous, and wonderful? Good. You got a good attitude? Your mind's right? Your spirit's good? You're thankful and grateful, ready for Thanksgiving? All right, fast all week. That way you can eat good on Thursday in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And uh, somebody, somebody told me somebody's having a colonoscopy on Wednesday. I said, man, that's taking getting ready for Thanksgiving real serious. <laughs> you know, the Lord wants to bless you. He wants to be good to you. He wants to give you a good life. And for all of us, we need to understand that we already do, but we need to be grateful and thankful and have a good spirit about us because of these things. You know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but if you were a king or a queen a hundred years ago, your life is better today than their life was then. You got more amenities. You got so many things to enjoy. Life is good, but we take it for granted. Like you just take for granted that you could just walk into Walmart and go to the back and they got chicken already ready for you. They already caught it, wrung the neck, plucked the feathers, skinned it, sliced off the breast or the thigh or whatever you're looking for, packaged it in cellophane, and it's just waiting for you. You take that for granted. Nobody's got to go catch the chicken. Nobody's going to shoot the turkey for Thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. It's already frozen and waiting for you, and it says butterball right on it. <laughs> you take for granted that you can drive on a paved road to get there. That's crazy, but you don't think about that. You go travel around the world and you get into some parts of the world that don't have a paved road to go 60 miles might take 8 to 10 hours. It don't matter how fast a car can go. If you don't have a paved road, you can't get where you need to get to in a timely way. We take for granted things like plumbing. How many of y'all into plumbing? You know what I love? I love going to the bathroom and you press a button and it goes away. Praise the Lord. I got a dog and kids. They supposed to pick up the, the, the dog stuff. They don't do it. Imagine if they had to pick up all the human stuff. It never get done, right? Thank God for plumbing. I'm in the air condition. Who's in the air condition by show of hands? Man, don't it feel good? I love it. I love air conditioning. But once you get it, you take it for granted. You, you don't realize it. If, if many people in here, you'd rather drive a hoopty with air condition than a Mercedes with no AC. Can I get an amen? Like, I look bad but feel good any day of the week, right? <laughs> Sign me up for that. And we just take it for granted. These are things 100 years ago didn't even exist. And God wants to bless you, but he wants you to be grateful and thankful. This is what Jesus said. Man, what does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world? If the chicken's already caught, plucked, skinned, and prepared. If the road is paved to get there. If he's got live plumbing and he's got air conditioning. What does it benefit a man to gain the whole world, but in the process forfeit his soul. Man, what good is it to you if you got a good life on earth, but your eternal life isn't secured and prepared for? You know, God has been good to us. And in return, we got to learn how to be generous and gracious and good back. There's some Bible stories I read and they, they bother me. You know, I, I don't know about you. I, sometimes I read a story in the Bible. I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Why is that in there? Why did I encounter that? You read the Bible, right? right? Sometimes I read, I'm like, man, I wish the pastor would preach on this. And the good thing is I'm the pastor. So I get to preach on this. Listen to this story. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. Let's say manager together on three, one, two, three manager. And the King James version says a steward and this is the idea of stewardship, that all that we have, we're just managing. Everything that we have is a gift from God, and we're managing. He had a manager handling his affairs. And one day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So he's wasteful. So is this a good employee or a bad employee? A good Christian or a bad Christian? It's bad. He's wasting. He's wasteful. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're about to be fired. Let's say, uh-oh, together on three. One, two, three. Uh-oh, you're about to get fired. So the manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches. He, not only was he wasteful, he was lazy too. Good or bad? Bad. And I'm too proud to beg. So he was wasteful, lazy, and prideful. Good or bad? Bad. Ah, 
I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who'll give me a home after I get fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man said, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, hurry up and erase that and change it to 400. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. He said, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. He said, look, take the bill, erase it, change it to 800. So not only, not only was he wasteful, not only was he lazy, not only was he prideful, he was dishonest too. Can we agree this is not the kind of person you would want to be? And then this is where Jesus drops the bomb. He says, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. So he was wasteful, he was lazy, he was prideful, he was manipulative, but he wasn't stupid. He wasn't a fool. He had a little bit of wisdom. He thought about the fact that, man, let me take advantage of what I have now to set myself up for a better future. And then Jesus said this, and it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd. That word means wise. They're more wise in dealing with the world around them than the children of light. So he's trying to tell the Christians, man, y'all better pay attention and learn a lesson right here. And he says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Now, here's the deal. If you're wasteful, lazy, prideful, and dishonest, and you make those kind of friends, what kind of eternal home you think is waiting for you? But if you take advantage of what you have and you say, man, let me think about this. Let me realize who's going to be my friends in the eternal life I want to have. Let me invest in heaven. Let me put forward to my future. That is a lesson we can still learn from this dishonest man who was not lazy, who was wasteful, who was prideful, yet he still understood one thing. He understood that what I have now determines what my future would be like. Now, before you get too excited, I want you to think about this. If... Uh, if, if you were one of these guys that owed the rich man money and the manager called you in and he said, hey, hey, Reuben, scratch out, scratch out 800, just put 400. He said, hey, Vincent, scratch out 1,000, put 800. Would you be grateful the guy did it? Probably, but would you hire that guy to work for you in the future? No, you wouldn't. Why? Because you know if he did it to him, it's only a matter of time before he does it to you. So in this situation, what God's trying to point out is a very important lesson because he goes on to say, if you're faithful in little things, then you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? And then he says this, nobody can serve two masters. You'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Here's what the manager knew that you need to get. He understood that the world that you live in right now and what you do with what you've been given impacts what your future is going to be. But Jesus takes it further. He says you also need to understand that the way you handle the little you've been given determines whether or not you'll be handling greater things in the life to come. And the way you handle your worldly wealth impacts the eternal riches that you get to handle. There's almost this idea that God has entrusted certain things to you and he's evaluating and looking at how you handle those things to determine in eternal life what you, my friend, can be entrusted with. I want this to be a really clear sermon for you. I want you to understand something. God has put you in charge of something. It is not yours. You're just a manager. You're just a steward. We talked about this last week. I said, how many of you have enough money to retire if you die tomorrow? And the answer is, everybody does. All you got to do is get through today. Matter of fact, some of you got some spending to do. Of course you do. But tomorrow is a gift from the Lord because you don't know whether you're going to wake up tomorrow. When you woke up this morning, God gave you the gift of breath to enjoy the life that you have. Nothing is promised. And if your life is expiring tonight and you don't wake up tomorrow, everything you've been managing, somebody else is going to be managing the day after. Because all we have 
is temporary. This world is fading. It's going away. The body you have is temporary. How many of you are old enough to know that you have body parts that already went to be with the Lord? <laughs> like that hip went to be with Jesus in 1996. Look, this finger's been broken since 1998. I can't even use this finger. If I point at my kids, they go, who you point at? <laughs> all of us, all of us have to realize this world is fading. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. You're just a manager, a steward. So do you do a good job of managing what God has entrusted to you? Let's talk about this. Good managers are people who, number one, are careful with their resources. They're careful with their resources, not careless. One day, a report came that the manager was wasteful. We don't want to be wasteful. We want to be careful with what God has given us. A Christian has a responsibility to manage their money regardless of how much money you make. Proverbs 23 says, know the state of your flocks. This has always been, been mind-blowing to me. A lot of times, even when a person has a lot of money, they actually don't manage it well. They don't know what they're dealing with. They don't know what they got going on. They don't know anything about their affairs. They're not paying attention to it. They're just counting on cash flow to cover whatever problems they might have. As long as the cash keeps coming in, we good. You actually have a responsibility as a Christian to manage your money well. This is what I teach my children. I want my children to take their first 10% and give it to the Lord, their second 10% and give it to their future. That's called saving. And then live off of 80%. You can do that. You can do that. Don't tell me you can't. There's a lady, now I'll never forget this story. Osceola McCarthy is her name. You probably don't know her. She was a black woman who was born in 1908 in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She wanted to be a nurse. She loved going to school. She had plans to be a nurse. When she was in the sixth grade, her aunt got very ill, and she had to drop out of school in order to care for her sick aunt. After caring for her aunt, she was never able to go back to school. She spent the remainder of her life as someone who washed clothes and ironed clothes and take, people, take care of people's clothes in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Eighty years go by. She's 87 years old. And she writes a letter to the University of Southern Mississippi, and she lets them know that she's got a planned gift donation when she dies. She's going to be establishing a scholarship fund for $150,000 for African-American students to go to the University of Southern Mississippi. She made very little money, but she managed it well. And when this story broke, it became national news because, you know, universities just don't get letters from people going, I'm planning on giving you $150,000. You're supposed to solicit those donations. <laughs> and you especially don't expect to see it from somebody who made close to minimum wage most of their life, but she managed her money well. And she said, you know what? I never got to get my education. I want to make sure somebody else who comes behind me can get theirs. When this story broke, so many people were moved that they began con contributing to the fund. It raised over $650,000 and has been passing out scholarships since 1998. The University of Southern Miss was so moved by this, they gave her an honorary degree. She received the second highest medal of honor from President Clinton, who was the president at the time. Harvard was so moved, they gave her an honorary PhD. She got a PhD from Harvard. Now, why would she do this? Because she was a Christian. And she knew she wanted her life to go beyond this. And she made sure when she died, she said, this is my plan. 10% is going to the church. 10% is going to my family. 20% she saved to pay the bills for the rest of her life. And the remaining 60% she gave to this thing that she felt like God had called her to. Don't tell me you can't live like this. You can live on 80%. You might have to make some sacrifices. You might have to do some things differently, but at the end of the day, you'll be a good manager because you'll be investing your life in the kingdom of God and your own future, making sure that you're putting things into God's kingdom and you're preparing yourself for your own future. Every one of us has to make the decision, do we want to serve the Lord with what, all we do, including being a good manager of our resources, which leads me to my second thing. You also need to be resourceful with your resources. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig a ditch, and I'm too proud to beg. And then it says the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. You know, he was wasteful. He was lazy. He was prideful. 
He was manipulative. But he had a good sense of self-assessment. He knew he wasn't going to be digging any ditches. Some of you, you're not dig, dig, digging tight. Did I say that right? <laughs> that didn't sound good. Some of you ain't built like that. You know, there's two kinds of people. There's house cats and alley cats. You know what I'm talking about. Which one of y'all are alley cats? Like, drop me off in the street. That's where I belong. If I got to do something like that, I, they ain't above me. Some people are alley, uh, house cats. They're not built for that. Man, that was this guy. He said, man, I'm not, I'm not built to dig a ditch. I'm too proud to beg. I'm not going to find myself there. He had a good sense of self-assessment. You know, good managers have an accurate assessment of the gifts, talents, abilities, and assets they have at their disposal. You know how to do much with what you have. This church has actually been known for its resourcefulness. We do way too much with way too little. That's what we do. That's how we handle it. That's what the situation is. That's how we go about everything that we do. We're resourceful. Just don't have a bunch of resources, but very resourceful. I remember when we first started, we were meeting at the Crown Plaza Hotel on the corner of Williams and Veterans. It's the old Holiday Inn Holodome. For those of you who grew up in Kenner, it's something else all together now, and we were meeting there. And we used a few different meeting rooms for our children's ministry. So they had a big conference center where we'd have our worship service, and we have these little children's ministry rooms. And we had this, uh, this uh, ministry. It was called Club 56, and it was for fifth and sixth graders. It was the predecessor to Midpoint. Midpoint's fifth, sixth, seven, but it was just Club 56. And Club 56 met in this upstairs little room that we had. You had to take an elevator to get up there. And they had this little, little meeting room. Well, because we were renting the hotel, sometimes they were like, hey, y'all can't have that room. And there was this one particular Sunday where we couldn't get access to that room. So we were sitting around having a meeting discussing how are we going to have Club 56 when the room's not available. And Pastor Javi, he's resourceful. He goes, well, man, you know they got a swimming pool. Why don't we have a pool party for all the fifth and sixth graders during church? So we asked the hotel, and they said, yeah, no problem. So we threw a pool party. Can you imagine how cool it is you in the fifth grade and you going to a pool party for church? <laughs> Kids are walking in. You saw some of them in their superhero costumes today. Imagine they're coming in with a towel and a bathing suit to church, <laughs> but we're resourceful, and they had a great time, and it moved in people's lives. We needed to get all the lights fixed in the parking lot. It was real dark at night. We've been having a lot of different traffic at night. We wanted to kind of light the place up. I wanted to shine with the glory of the Lord, you know. And uh, we really didn't have the, the money to do that. Well, Pastor Lance is resourceful, so he borrowed a lift from somebody in the church, and he went up and has the mechanical skills. He changed all the lights personally himself one by one, and we're able to do what we need to do. You're supposed to be resourceful. I was thinking about my wife's family. Many of them are sitting on the front row here. My mother-in-law, Debbie, she was in the first service. You know, when, when she was raising her kids, it was five of them, and their dad, before he became a Christian and got clean, he was addicted to crack. So the dad, their dad's out on crack. He's, he's nowhere to be found. They ain't got no money. And uh, she's trying to figure out how to feed these kids, and she don't have the money to feed them. And so they, they came up with something called pork chop casserole. And pork chop casserole is simply what you call it when you don't have enough pork chops for everybody. So you cut the pork chops in little pieces, and nobody knows really how much they got, and you just fill it in with rice. We got enough rice for all of y'all, but we ain't got enough pork chops, so that's called pork chop casserole, right? Sometimes you got to be resourceful. There's nothing wrong with that. Be resourceful with what God has given to you. Sometimes you got to open the cupboard. you got to open the pantry and go, man, what do we have to work with? When Jesus fed the 5,000, they didn't have any food, right? And so the, 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 the apostles came to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, all these people are hungry. You need to send them home. And Jesus said, no, 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 let's feed them. And they said, well, what? And he said, well, what y'all got? What y'all got? He said, well, all we got is this one little kid. He packed a lunch. Apparently, he knew how long church would be. <laughs> he got a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. That's all we got. And Jesus said, bring it to me. And it says he, he, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. And when they were done, it says that there were 12 baskets of leftovers. How many apostles were there? 12. It was like, here's one basket for you, here's one basket for you, here's one basket for you, O oh, ye of little faith. And it says when he gets to the end, he's got the scraps and the leftovers. And here's the lesson. If all you have to work with is scraps and leftovers, that's still more in the hands of God than you starting from scratch with something new you think he needs. Just go walk into your house 
You want to name it and claim it, do it like this. That toaster, Lord, that's your toaster. That oven, that's, that's your oven, Lord. That car, that's your car. That vacuum cleaner, that's your vacuum cleaner. This house, that's your house. This sofa, that's your sofa. Because all of us need to realize what this is all about. You know, we, don't, we all take for granted what we have. You know, you have a TV, 200 channels, and what you say? Ain't nothing to watch. You go in a walk-in closet, you look at all the clothes, what you say? Ain't got nothing to wear. You don't realize how much you have. You just got to take the things that are in your life and say, Lord, these things, they belong to you. These are yours. This is in your hands. All that I have. The truth is you can't give anything to the Lord because he gave it to you. All you can do is give it back to him. It's all his. Everything belongs to him. We're just the managers. Here's number three. You got to be faithful with your resources. Luke 16, 10 through 12. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? 1 Corinthians 4, a person put in charge of your manager must be faithful. You got to be faithful with the things that are given to you. Let me ask you this. I, I remember I was working at the church. My first job was janitor. The receptionist's name was Penny Klein. I'll never forget this moment. I've shared it before, but it always sticks with me. I was walking by Penny's desk, and she said, manly, God just, he just wrecked me. I said, what happened? She said, I was asking the Lord to give me something new to do. And the Lord said, why would I give you something new when you never did the last thing I asked you to do? And that wrecked me too. Yeah, I remember this. I remember this moment. I drove home. I call it the iPad on the lawn moment. I drove home. I pull in the driveway. I go to walk in the house, and there's an iPad on the front lawn. One of my kids was just like, bah. And I have four kids. I asked all four of them. None of them did it. It's a miracle. The Lord put the iPad there, apparently. <laughs> and it really it didn't sit well with me. Where's my parents at? You understand what I'm saying? It didn't sit well with me, right? And, you know, I'm from Gentilly. If you leave your bike outside and you go get a sip of water, when you come back, your bike <laughs> is with Jesus now. It's gone. And it's not gone now. It's gone forever. You never see that bike? You're going to see the bike. Somebody else will be riding there already spray-painted in silver, you know? <laughs> Nah, this ain't yours. I just got this brand new silver spray painted bike. <laughs> and I seen the iPad on the lawn. And I, and I just thought, man, like, like why, why would I want to bless my children with more when they ain't being faithful with what they have? Let, let me just ask, ask you this. How do you upkeep and maintain the things that God has already entrusted to you? Do you pay your bills? Do you pay your debts? Do you send out invoices? Do you know when what comes in and when what is due when? Do you know what you owe? The way you handle your money and the way you handle your possessions is a part of your Christian witness. Do you clean your car? Do you get your oil changed? You want God to bless you with a new car, but you ain't taking care of the one you got. I heard a pastor say one time, he's like, man, a lot of pastors want God to bless them with a big church, but they can't keep a closet in order. Why would God give them a whole church full of people to keep in order? There's a lot of people in this church. You know how hard it is to pastor this group? Not you, but the other people, they got a lot of problems. <laughs> you got to keep it all in order, man. What's your car look like right now? Is it in order? Are you on top of things? You know, when people come to the church and they want financial help, which happens sometimes, and we, we do help people. We do help people a lot. But when a person comes in and they say, man, I want some help, we don't just shoot cash at them. We go, well, man, tell me what's going on. We go, well, you know, like, like if they want help with rent, say, like, well, how many months behind are you? I'm four months behind. Well, we're not going to pay one month of rent. Because we're going to pay one month of rent, the landlord's going to take that and still evict you. We need a game plan. And you'd be amazed. We get the people who go, man, you, know, you got a car note? How much is it? I don't know. Well, well are, you, are you on time or are you behind? I, I, I don't know. How much, how much do you owe on it? I, I, I don't know. How many more payments you got left? I, I don't know. To be faithful, you got to know. You got to know what you have and what you owe and when it's due. And how many more payments you got? And what the situation is, that's a responsibility. It's a part of your witness. It's a part of your testimony. You got to take care of the things that you have. Do you clean your shoes? 
And you're over here thinking, man, replacement is everything, which is why we get so out of sorts because we're so ungrateful and discontent. We think the solution's always something else or something more or something new. When are you going to be content with just what you got? The Apostle Paul said, man, I learned the secret to being content, which means he didn't start out content. He had to figure out how to get it. Man, there's a secret to it. I got to be content and grateful and thankful. You'll never be faithful with God's blessing if you're constantly complaining that you don't have enough. Then you got to be purposeful. Luke 16, he says, if you're untrustworthy and worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with the true riches of heaven? You know, heaven's going to be a wonderful place for all who experience it, but it's not going to be the same for everybody. You might, no, maybe nobody told you this. Maybe nobody told you this. There are different judgments in the Bible. One of the judgments is where God determines who's going to heaven and who's not. But there's another judgment. After it's decided you go into heaven, it's called the Bema seat judgment is what it's called. It's a, it's a seat that the, uh, the Greek judge would sit on to determine where people finish the race. And it's going to evaluate how faithful you are with your worldly wealth to invest it in the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says don't store your treasure on earth. Store your treasure in heaven. You're going to stand before God and face judgment, and God is going to look at your life and look at your account. I mean, there is a, a record of what you did with what you had. And he's going to entrust different people. Somebody going to be cutting grass in heaven. It ain't going to be me. And your mentality should be it ain't going to be you. You know, as a pastor, I have a responsibility. I want you to stay in judgment for God. And God says, all right, let's look at all you did. And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the person next to you, they're going to be getting into heaven too. And you'll be like, man, you, you, your account ain't got nothing in it. And they're going to look at you and be like, man, how do you know to invest in heaven? And you're going to say, man, your, your pastor didn't tell you nothing. Your pastor's telling you something. Man, when you stand before God, there is an account. Rewards get passed out based upon how well you manage what you have. And you might be wondering, well, that, that's all cool, but do you practice what you preach? But this is what I'll tell you. Dana's friend, Sherry, Sherry's sitting right there. Dana's sitting right there. Dana's friend, Sherry, was working at a tax place. During tax season, they needed somebody to fill in. Dana went and showed up, and she filled in. She was working a couple of days a week. They met the person who had previously owned a tax place and was still doing taxes, was in the process of selling the business. They began sharing their faith with them. They began talking to them about the same time this is happening. My accountant fired me. He said, I'm not doing no taxes no more. Figure it out. Well, if you've ever changed accountants, it's the most painful thing in all the world. It's miserable. And I'm like, I don't know who I'm going to get to do my taxes. Well, Dana talks to the people. And the guy's name's Dave. Dave agrees to do the taxes. He's going to do my taxes. So I go in. And, you know, I don't know if y'all know this, but the accountants, they know the truth. It don't matter what car you drive, where your house is at, how you dress. The accountant knows what you really working with. He sees all of my business. And after spending time with me and Dana and Sherry and her husband, Jason, and their families, Dave and his wife, they start coming to church here. Dave knows whether or not I'm giving any money to the work of the Lord. Dave knows what I'm doing. Not only is he coming to church here, he's giving here. And he said, man, I want to invest my life in here because he knows the truth. Look, the truth is I want you to be blessed in this life, but more importantly than that, I want you to stand before God and see your account in heaven and it's stacking up. You got an account right now. Like you go to heaven.com. Maybe that's not it, lambsbookoflife.com. I don't know what the website is. And you got to log in, and when you log in, you got an account, and your account states what you did. And there ain't no hiding it, there ain't no secret, and there's no pressure. There's no pressure. Listen, if you want to come to church here, and you want to eat six donuts and drink three cups of coffee and leave your kids in the children's ministry for an hour and suck up the AC, you can do that. Nobody's going to tell you nothing. But I'm just letting you know that right now there's an account building in heaven with your name on it. And I want you to stand before the Lord and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to bless you in abundance because I know how you handle worldly wealth shows me you can be entrusted with the true riches of heaven. 
Man, every one of us has a choice to make. Every one of us has a decision to make. When you look at that account, when you, when you see that, when you go to heaven.com and you log in, you see, well, this is what I got. You know what you're working with. You know what you got. In your life, there should be an investment in what's going to last forever. Because remember, this world is fading and dying. And we don't do it out of some strange motivation. Man, I'm just grateful and thankful the Lord saved me and he blessed me in the first place. What is it for me to give a little bit back to him when he's already given me so much? Every single one of us has a choice to make and a choice to train up our children and a choice to reach the next generation and to do what needs to happen. Man, the facts, the facts would blow your mind. This church is already extremely generous, extremely generous. Now, I, I was here yesterday. We given out the 250 meals. The, the Gideons came. They joined us. They passed out 350 Bibles. We're not just giving food out. You got to pop your trunk. One team's putting the food in. Another team's praying for them in the window. We ministering to people. They led people to Jesus. They had people going, man, I want to come to church here. And I'm sitting there watching it going, man, look at all the accounts of heaven filling up with people. Look at all the accounts of people that are, that are seeing the investment that they're making be more than what this world is all about. That indeed is something worth living for. Because now all of a sudden what I'm living for is not temporary and going to fade away and going to die. It's going to go on beyond that. And think about how God looks at you. When God drives up, and he sees the iPad on the lawn, he ain't thinking, let me bless these people. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But when God shows up and he sees that your affairs are in order and you're being a good steward and you're being responsible and you're a good manager of all that he's given you, he goes, man, I want to bless that person. This, this messes me up. There's a story. It says God gave that, that, that there's a man, he gave one man five talents, one man two, and one man one. Talent is a weight, a measurement. And he says, the one who invested five, he invested it, he made more, and God said, great job. The one who had two, he invested it, and made more, God said, great job. The one who had one, he said, man, I was so scared I ain't did nothing. And the Lord said, give me that one. And he gave it to the dude that had five. You go, man, that seems so unfair. He already turned his five into ten, now he's got eleven. And the Lord says, yep, and I'm going to give him every one he wants because I know he can be trusted with what I give him. Well done, good and faithful. You've been faithful in a little. Be faithful in a much. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow with me. Lord, I just pray that your, your grace, your mercy, your generosity would be on everyone here. Man, what a great way to live our lives. Invest in, in God's kingdom. Invest in, in our eternal life. Invest in, in other people knowing your name and your love and your sacrifice and your grace and your mercy and your truth. What a great blessing to be generous and to know the joy that comes from being a giver and living our lives with faith and trust and understanding and knowing who you are. I pray that anointing would be on everyone here today. I pray that the spirit of God that is generous and gives, God loved the world so much he gave his only son. That same giving spirit would be on everyone today. Let us be grateful and generous in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise.